Flexibility training is so much more than just stretching, but at the same time, it kind of isn't. As of any practice or discipline, we can make things as simple or as complicated as we like. But essentially, the most important aspect of it is just training it. It's easy to overcomplicate things with flexibility training. As you see out there, all of the different names and types of stretching that we have, maybe FRC, loaded stretching, end range conditioning, PNF, PIR, all of the things out there. Really, developing flexibility can and should be relatively simple, but ultimately the best way to go and apply it. First thing that I just want to mention very briefly is, is the common terms of mobility and flexibility. I'm going to use the umbrella term of flexibility here as something that describes all training practices that is aimed at developing range of motion. There is a technical difference between mobility and flexibility, but again, more complexity. Let's just call it flexibility training, and then we'll get into the different types in a second. So a lot of what I'm going to share today is going to be from a book called Stretching Scientifically. Fantastic one and uh, a guide to flexibility training. If you do want a book, to pick one up. In this book, there is three different types of flexibility, which kind of covers most applications. We have first, dynamic active flexibility. We have static active flexibility, and then we have static passive flexibility. There are some more types and there are some different types of stretching or flexibility methods that don't necessarily fall into these categories, but for the most part, this is going to have you covered. First up, we've got dynamic active flexibility, and this is moving dynamically through our full range of motion. So in reality, it covers a lot of different movements because when we move and when we do an exercise, we have to have simultaneously the lengthening of one side of the joint and the shortening of one side of the joint. One side has to contract and the other has to relax. This is known as reciprocal inhibition, and it's a spinal process that essentially prevents your muscles from working against each other when you're performing a movement. And we can work with this concept to improve flexibility, you know, from something as simple as the very popular split squat for developing hip mobility, to a bicep curl also needs reciprocal inhibition, to a Jefferson curl, which needs the reciprocal inhibition so that we can lengthen the hamstrings and contract the hip flexors and quad. Something to consider with the dynamic active type of flexibility is velocity. And this especially applies to people who are interested in things like martial arts, where speed of a kick is important. These two movements are essentially trying to develop the same range of motion. We have one that is loaded, it's much more controlled and it's slower, and the other is much more dynamic and we're in the range much less. Both will essentially develop the same range of motion. The intent, however, is slightly different and this is where you need to consider what is your application, what flexibility do you require for your sport or your practice. This first type of flexibility training is the most broad and really covers most practices and most training. If we're performing a movement with the intent of trying to move through our largest range of motion, you're essentially performing flexibility training. It's really that simple. Next, we have static active flexibility, and this is essentially our ability to hold a stretch position using the strength of the shortening or agonist side of the joint, whilst the lengthening, the antagonist, relaxes to allow us to hold this stretch position. This is one of those movements that I see the most benefit when it comes to people applying this to their flexibility training. It's often the one that's under-trained, so people see quicker improvements and see that development of range happen on a faster basis in comparison to other training methods. A classic example of this is the standing leg raise, where we try to lift the leg up using the strength of the hip flexor and the quad, and then subsequently we have the relaxation and the lengthening of the hamstrings. Another example would be the original clip of this, which is the shoulder extension. One thing to consider with this particular movement is the vector at which we're performing it, because some of these movements can be particularly challenging. And if we change the angle of gravity, it can make them easier or harder. A great example, again, is taking that standing leg lift, but we can also perform the movement lying. We're essentially gonna be training the same thing, using the same muscles, but because the vector of gravity is acting down, it makes it easier in that top position. It's just a way of scaling the movements so that you can do them at any level. The final type of flexibility is static passive flexibility. And this essentially refers to getting into an extended, a stretch position and then holding for time. This can be under your own strength. It can be using an external force. But essentially, we just need to stretch. There are, however, two different ways in which we can apply static passive flexibility. 
We've got isometric stretching or flexibility, and then we've got relaxed stretching or flexibility. Both are going to use very similar positions, but again, much like other drills in this particular video, the intention is different. Isometric stretching just refers to applying an isometric contraction in a stretch position. And we do this just to try and take advantage of it and get deeper into a position. This is commonly referred to as PNF or contract relaxed stretching. It can be done in a supported position, such as this pancake. I'm stretching the hamstrings and the adductors. I can do a contraction where I press the heel down into the ground. I also slightly try to squeeze the legs in. I do maximum effort, four, five, ten seconds. And then when I relax, I'm going to try and sink deeper into it. This is a lower intensity version of isometric stretching, but it's still isometric stretching that is not relaxed. <laughs> isometric stretching can also be performed in more active positions where we're having to already contract and take load. And again, apply contractions. We try to contract the stretch muscle, relax and shift deeper. But we're already contracting at a higher rate because we're performing this in an already loaded position. Relaxed stretching is the other part of static passive flexibility. We're going to use much the same positions and you know the ranges of motion that we might do with the isometric stretching, but the intention is completely different. Whereas beforehand, we're focused on the contraction of the stretch muscle and trying to contract it harder. Here, we're focusing on trying to contract as little as possible and relax all muscles so we can then just sit in the stretch and breathe. This is a much lower intensity of stretching. It's something that can be done on a daily basis, even if you're sore, to still use that range of motion you're trying to develop. But the results from it tend to be not quite as quick as the other methods covered in this video. As I mentioned previously, dynamic active flexibility is kind of in all of our training. If you have the element where you're trying to use the maximum range of motion you have, whether that's in your strength training or whether that's in the practice, the sport that you do, you will have and you will progress with flexibility. That's kind of already covered and an easy one to add in. I do find that the best progress tends to come from the combination of static active stretching combined with static passive stretching, specifically isometric stretching holding those positions, especially at the higher end of contractions for things like middle split, uh, front split, bridge, etc., will prove to provide the best results. This doesn't mean relaxed stretching isn't useful as well. As I said, you can use it on occasions where you're sore, you can do it on a daily basis, and you can kind of grease through those grooves. All of these different types of flexibility training have purpose and are useful. You need to figure out what's going to work best for you with your overall training setup and what you want to achieve out of it. If you want some further help of how to apply and put flexibility training into your practice, then I did a whole video on that a few weeks ago. I'll link to that one down below, as well as a link to my app, which you can get programs for everything from handstand strength and flexibility. All of these sort of details are in the description down below. There's a lot of nuance out there, a lot of opinions when it comes to flexibility training. I'd love to hear yours and what you thought of this one and kind of trying to simplify things down and make it easy to apply so ultimately we can actually do the thing and make the progress with it. That being said, if this video was helpful to you and you enjoyed it, make sure you hit the thumbs up button and support the channel. Right next to it is that subscribe button if you want to join the Bodyweight Warrior Tribe. Don't miss out on any more future videos. But other than that, I'll catch you in the next one. Have a strong week and peace.